Thank you, guys. Um, just as a clarification, unfortunately, there's no lunch at the end of this presentation. That was already in the previous one. But hopefully, there's a couple information nuggets that might come in handy and useful. Uh, so the title that I've asked to talk about is Design Operations in Automotive. There's a, a, an alternative title, which is Designing the Future. So that's basically what we're going to talk about for the next 30 minutes or so. Before we kick it off, I need to get this thing working. And then I'll just spoof through a couple of who we are slides really quickly so that we get into the point. So we're Sealy Auto, the world's premier creative technology studio fully focused on developing the user experience of digital mobility. What that means in plain language is we typically work on the next generation cars and vehicles, and we develop the software and digital services uh, for those. We are 750 people and counting. Uh, we've got presence in Americas or in the US and here in Europe. So that we've got sales offices in the blue locations and then our software studios or creative technology studios, as we like them to, to call them, are in Poland and in Finland. Sorry, I need to be. So the stuff that I'm going to cover here is basically our design ops experience from projects ranging from uh, 2013 all the way to, to today. And so what we do is we typically work with the auto OEMs, usually the kind of in-house disruptor organizations or, or development organizations there, and then also with the new EV disruptors, usually coming from, uh, from China. Also done a lot of projects for tier one integrators, and then there's uh, our own in-house in R&D capability. Now, for obvious reasons, I, it's hard for me to put up you know, a case from the two first here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about our innovation through an in-house R&D project. Uh, and it's, that project is, by the way, also visible and seen on the stand of Sealy downstairs. So if you want to check it out later on, you're more than welcome to do that. So design operations in automotive the way we see it. Now, we are technology agnostic. We're also design process agnostic, which means that a lot of our projects go through the path of, of the typical business design, service design, and so forth. Um, and that obviously always starts with a really deep consumer insight. So there's a job to be done. How do we figure out a technology solution to it? However, just to make things a little bit more interesting, I wanted to show you another way to the same end solution. I've kind of used to call this, you know, the revenge of the technologist, because it kind of starts from the exact opposite way. So let's first figure out an interesting new technology. Let's then figure out if there's, uh, you know, a good use case that might be uh, an idea for that, that benefits all of the parties involved. And then after that, let's put it out into consumer testing. So it's kind of the, only, the, the way around. And our opinion is that <clears throat> it's probably equally good of a way into a, a good feature idea or into a good uh, usage concept, even if you do it this way around. It's kind of like uh, Jeff Bezos waking up one morning he didn't go through, oh, people want to wanna, 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 uh, buy books online. Why don't I design the technology, i.e. the internet, and then we're in business? No, it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, for every case that there's been a design inside, there's probably 100 cases where people just started playing around with one technology, tried to figure out how can we use this for something beneficial. So the, the example case that I'm going to talk about is called Ad Drive. And the basic idea is to tap into a secondary revenue stream 
uh, for mobility services. So if the primary revenue stream is direct from the consumer, direct from the user, uh, direct from the fleet owner, then this secondary revenue is how do we monetize by delivering an advertiser either an audience or actually people who are on their way somewhere and what we're selling is a behavioral change. So the tech inside, uh, inside kind of starts from where most of your people are right now. So we've kind of gone from, from the analog cluster to a partially or fully digital cluster. However, if you look at kind of how they look and how they feel today, it's kind of the same, but in a digital format. It's kind of the same, but just transferred on, you know, one, two, three, or four iPads in a row in the cockpit. I'm over-exaggerating, but only a little bit. And so how can we kind of get into a situation where, for example, I'm not sure how visible that is, but the background is one person's personal Netflix menu. How can we get from the uh, media equivalent of, oh, we're still ABC, CBS, and NBC, we're just now kind of showing you the same programming through the internet to we're Netflix and we're just gonna reinvent the whole user experience. And the lesson from there basically is that machine learning fueled by structured and unstructured data unleashes the opportunities of a fully digital cockpit. Like that's when we're in business, that's when we're actually using the digitalization to something that grows or makes the user experience better. We move from kind of the cost saving side to the to the uh, incremental revenue side in the business case. And that's kind of a long way of saying it. The shorter way of saying it is, shouldn't we use technology to show a different HMI for different people in different situations? So, okay, if that's the tech inside, so you pair a fully digital cockpit with machine learning and active personalization and customization of the content, does that then, as an idea, create value to all parties? And the idea here then is an ad-sponsored navigation system for car share vehicles. That seems to be kind of an easy way or an easy place to start. I'm sorry, I'm completely out of sync with the thing. Um, so if we think that this is an idea worth pursuing, the classic design methodology would kind of put us back to the drawing board. And we have to do that as well. But our method of operating a more lean innovation system feels better to us in this kind of a an environment where kind of everything is new. So instead of saying that, you know, we know everything and we can design the perfect solution, what we do is let's stage a number of experiments. If they work, if it becomes a great feature or a great service, we'll call ourselves genius, geniuses and our client too. And if it, if it doesn't, we'll call it market research, no problem. On to the next one. Sorry, now I killed the whole thing. It has a will of its own. Can you help me out with that one? I'm gonna try and figure this one out while we're doing that. Is this thing jumping around? Or? It's, it's kind of forcing it to the end uh -huh. and not Should we letting me go back. Should we just finish it without the whole thing? Yeah, let's pull it in so you've got some control. And then we can, 
I'll get back there. That's a good slide, right? <laughs> yeah, I like that one. We'll leave that one. Maybe it's just like whenever it sees that, it just, <laughs> it just st stops there. We'll where were we? We're too cute. I can just finish it from here too. Yeah, we'll try this on B. Sorry, guys. Nope. Look, I'll just do it from the keyboard. Oh, okay. I think it's gonna, all right. Wish me luck. Um, all right, so back to the idea. Does it create value for all parties? Is this a tech solution looking for a problem? Yes, it is. And people say like it's a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. It's actually a really good way to get to the idea. Let's test the numbers a little bit. So a typical car share ride is around uh, 0.40 euros a minute. A typical car trip seems to be around 20 minutes. And then there's some hidden fees, which kind of takes an average cost of a ride somewhere in the range of 10 euros. These are European numbers. So if you take that, and then you look at how much marketers already today are paying on Google for the most sought after uh, AdWords, you know, a typical bid for a high value, not even the highest value, like those go in thousands, but like, like a moderately uh, popular or a very popular high value search keyword is 40 euros. So 4X the revenue potential of just the consumer revenue that you get from a typical trip. So then the question kind of moved forward and became how much could a car sharing platform charge for directing people to specific businesses or locations? So what if you replicated Google only in the real world and so that people actually show up in the brick and mortar retail or whatever the services that's provided? Uh, Three improvised use cases. Number one, you know, I get in the car, I figure out at that point that at the destination, it's a rainy day, maybe we should go see a movie and not the theme park. Christmas, maybe we should go to the mall outside of the city because they are paying for the miles. And by the way, if we buy our Christmas presents at that out of town mall, they'll pay the miles back as well. So, so sponsored miles as a use case. And then the third one, I'm not quite sure about this one, like I gotta get into rehab. Probably you shouldn't drive at that point, but let's assume that you do. You know, I need to quit. Where's the best closest rehab? Wait, am I fit to drive? Well, we don't know that. We know that that's one of the most highest paid uh, keywords again. So this is kind of the basic idea evolved into this. So how could we help people take, do what they were planning to do originally, whether that's entertain themselves and their family, whether that's doing Christmas shopping, or whether that's completely something different. So why don't we kind of turn advertising in to a useful service? So an ad-sponsored navigation system for car share, vehicles, now it's doing it, the same thing for me again. Let's hope for the best. And then the user validation. So contextual ads can be a part of the service instead of seen as unnecessary spam. A lot of people right now disagree with this. So here's a recent article, why commercials in Andro Auto could turn your dashboard, dashboard into a dumpster fire. Now, that's probably true if you're kind of looking for attention, which is very scarce and 
given in like three seconds or less increments when you're in a car, especially if you're in the driver's seat. So that's one problem. The other thing that I just wanted to point out is Android Army, and no offense against the publication, but they're making this noise about advertising in cars on a website that has one, two, three, four ads visible, and if you scroll down, there's 10 more. So it's kind of like, well, you gotta go where the money is. So advertising moving from like the traditional definition of advertising, which is I want your attention so that I can sell you something to add as a user, use for information. So you told me in the navigation system that you already are going there. Let me just give you a better option. So we go into the prototyping stage. So most of our prototyping work falls into two categories. The first one is the traditional proof of concept, and the other one is a business prototype. What we're talking about today is the business prototype, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip the POC and say, when we talk about business prototypes, we typically aim at actualizing an often very blurry business concept into something tangible, which is kind of what I tried to take you through in this kind of, you know, here are a couple of interesting technologies, what if we put them together, what could that mean? And, and, and then bringing that into, uh, into life in terms of a prototype. So I mentioned that we work with the OEMs and their brands and with tier one integrators. They're typically very good at what they do, but they're also large organizations. So if this was happening, and it is happening, inside one of those large organizations, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what usually happens. So design comes up, or product management, or product R&D comes up with a concept. And they load it into Keynote, or maybe they load it into a tablet, and they start this journey across multiple silos. They leave the design department, and they go at least to a different floor on that big company building, maybe even to a different city, maybe even to a different continent, and meet the software guys. And then the software guys, they look at the, they look at the idea and the presentation, and they're like, come on, guys. Like, that's never going to work in practice. And in many cases, they're right. It's not. So what we try to do is build a small design ops team in between. Now, that team is not only Sealy Auto people. It is also people from the design department. It is also people from the software development, the UI or the HMI software development. But to place this small uh, team in between that then tries to remove those silos. Uh, it's kind of funny in the slide, actually, how you, you know, you kind of take two buzzwords, design thinking and agile, and then you fight against them with a third one, which is lean, but that's what we do. Um, one of the biggest, one of the hardest things, which is a cultural thing for us, and I bet for everybody else, is building this team as equal partners. So so that there's a natural respect from the designers towards the technologists and, and vice versa. And there's this kind of hybrid function in between, which we call technical design. That's a concept mainly stolen from the game development uh, companies, the studios, somewhat from the mobile uh, companies as well. But that's the main idea, like just building a small team in between. Um, these numbers are indicative or ration, you know, gives you a ratio at best. But the thing, the takeaway from that is that that team in the middle doesn't have to be big. Actually, it should not be big. If it becomes big, that will be counterproductive. So 
you know, with round numbers, if there's a design team headcount of 100 and a software team headcount of 500, 15, 20 people will do the job brilliantly. Um, the one thing that I left out of, let me go back one if I can. The one thing that I left out of this is kind of the exact team composition. And the reason is that it varies case by case. So I, in some cases, we've had interior, interior designers participating in the team. In others, we've had, uh, well, there's, there's, there's a, a ton of, uh, a ton of uh, you know, data, data scientists, data analysts, and so forth being a part of the team as well. The three constant roles that we see in there is UX, UI designer, technical designer, software developer. And then everybody else is, is kind of running around that. OK, so that got us into prototype number one, a car sharing system that allows the user to opt in to receive marketing messages from third party advertisers. So there's promoted po points of interest on the map, and then a quick way of purchasing that. And this, in this version, this is a part of the navigation system and the center stack IVI. How does QT come in? Well, in a very uh, obvious way, so the proto prototype is a definition of something that's usually thrown away after the validation is done. This happens especially in cases where everything is done uh, purely in the design department. In the spirit of Lean, what we try to do is not making things that are disposable. So we have this kind of, we've built this skill called uh, Proto-production or proto-production, depending on who uses the term. And the idea is that from the business prototype to the actual prototype to production, we do as much of the work on the same platform. So we start already with something that could be considered uh, target hardware and a automotive um, capable, a automotive uh, qualifying uh, software toolkit. So, so if we do that, then we kind of use the same team, the same tech stack, QT, and the same project pipeline to take in the ideas, refine them into concepts and user experiences, and ultimately even, you know, having that team transfer over at least a part of the, the, the um, responsibilities when it goes to production and is ready to be implemented in terms of features, applications, and services. Here's the same story in kind of three, a triple track lean innovation model. So you start with the business prototype. We usually embrace idea portfolios, so not testing one idea, but we might have four or we might have 40 of variations, and then we A-B test those with the users. So in the business, business prototype, in the understanding point, you know, we go in with an idea portfolio. Again, the same idea. We don't know in this completely new space of mobility services what's going to pick up and what's not. So let's hedge our bets and let's Let's manage ideas as a portfolio. So one of them, like idea three in this case, might just disappear, like it didn't make it. Uh, four might pivot into something completely different. And then number one makes it to the discover stage where we kind of go from, are we, move, are we building the right thing towards are we actually designing the right, in the right way? And then when that works, then kind of going to the next level, which is production, delivering the thing, which is building it the right way. So thanks to QT, uh, we've been able to max out the technical designer role, so we can kind of do a lot of the things 
in the technical design, uh, small teams, that small team in between uh, the, the, the silos, that's led to fast interactions on UI and fast and cost-efficient concept verifications, as seen in the previous slide. We've saved time spent on low-level development due to support of embedded platforms, and we've integrated third-party 3D components with easy and hassle-free. I think that definition, the, a part of the team is here. I think that definition, like somebody says it's hassle-free and easy, somebody else might say it's a lot of work, sweat, and tears. But anyways, uh, the, it does, it does work, work for us really well. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna show you the demo tech stack for the proto number one. And sorry, let me know when you have the snapshot. <laughs> um, the prototype simulates the ad support extension to the navigation system. So it's a part of the navigation system. Um, it starts by collecting a profile, but it also offers a direct um, reward for giving that profile. You may have noticed there's been a little bit of talk about like, you know, collecting data and so forth recently. So people in consumer research seem to be coming more and more uh, cautious about their data. However, if there is a direct reward, in this case, personalized vehicle settings, no matter what car share vehicle you step into, then we're back in business. And then of course, against those personalized settings, there's also personalized ads. So the ad gives relevant brands the opportunity to influence buyer behavior at exactly the right moment. And this, if you talk to the advertisers, if you talk to the consumer brand companies, is no small thing. We have a little bit of insight from outside of this presentation, which is um, our mobile part of the business at Sealy, already quite some years back, did this thing for uh, Rovio, the studio behind Angry Birds, which was location-based advertising that kind of used the same mechanics, but in mobile. So you were playing the game in China, and you could opt in to see targeted offers from McDonald's. So you would play the game, you get your three stars, and then after that you see a map. And the map says, here are the, the closest locations of, of uh, McDonald's restaurants. If you physically go to one of those restaurants, we will notice you, and we're gonna open up new levels, new uh, rewards, and, and, and so forth while you're in the restaurant. That was a massive hit, by the way. So, so the consumer goods companies are super interested in all of this that basically tra drives physical traffic into the stores. So that's kind of what we outlined in point two that we wanted to test. Is this really a win-win-win for all of the parties? So for a car sharing company, it looks like a win. You know, you get, first of all, a very large and extensive new pool of consumer data, user data. You also can tap into significant incremental revenue in terms of somebody else sponsoring those rides. For the driver passenger, it does give you a better personal experience. It is kind of one of those things. What was the term that Jared used in the morning? He always said, cool, but creepy. This is one of those. This is one of those because what we're doing here is we're doing the marketer's wet dream, which is we're actually changing behavior. So on one hand, we're gonna say to the consumers, hey, you don't have to look through all these banner ads because we're not buying attention from the car sharing company. We're buying behavior. So we're gonna mask it up as a service. and We're gonna say, hey, we'll take you where you were gonna go anyway maybe a different location, but we'll take you to do the same thing you were gonna do anyway. However, uh, the market is gonna pay for it. And what happens in the background is we've actually come into this 
this kind of unchartered uh, territory where we're manipulating direct behavior. So for sure the car sharing company, for sure the marketeer, for sure there is a better personal experience at the end of this for the, for the driver, however, you know, cool but creepy. Last slide. So the bottom-up approach to transformation, there's a lot of top-down transformation projects going on with all of our clients, and there should be. The change from automotive to mobility services is, by all accounts, massive. However, there's also another way. There's also the startup way, and there is a way to replicate that startup way in the large companies, and that's kind of what we're trying to do. So placing a small team in the middle of the design and engineering departments, having this, it's only like a one, two, three step process, but it is a way to, to uh, bring validity to your assumptions, and it is a way of actually kind of proving your, your design. And it gives you sometimes a seat at a bigger table where you know, the small 750 people Sealy would otherwise be invited to. Uh, it seems that it works best if you work in one location and in short cycles. And what is imp important is to put the technology and the business and the user understanding together. Whether you do it from a process point of view, you know, service design first or technology design first doesn't seem to matter as much. And then the last thing is this kind of magic spell of prototypes. Like when you have this thing in front of the team, quite often everybody who's kind of look at it from their silo or their political ambitions or from their whatever point of view, forgets that and starts to look at actually the prototype and actually deliverable uh, thing, which brings a lot of focus into designing the future. Thank you, guys.